who's an uh, experimental rock physicist, combines and processes new methods to understand the natural processes. Since 2016, he's been an assistant professor at the Department of the Geological Sciences at the University of Texas, where he's a principal investigator of the Rock Deformation Laboratory. In 2013, he was under the supervision of Dr. Berlini and Berg from ETH Zurich, where he received his PhD in the attenuation of seismic waves in saturated rock. Uh, Nicola has received his uh, master's from the University of Padova under Professor Di Toro. And in 2014 and 15, he was a postdoc at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Professor Grisselli. I had the honor of being around Dr. Sato for a while. I learned a lot from him in the lab and um, it's great to see you here. Um, and the presentation today is titled Attenuation of Seismic Waves. With this, um, I welcome Dr. Sato. Thank you very much, Ali, for a very kind introduction. And again, thank you for the invitation to present here. It's always nice to be, to be home, if I can say. Um, okay, so uh, thank you also, Karim, for the invitation, by the way. Karim and, and Ali organized this. Okay, so today, uh, in the next, uh, how much do we have? A couple of hours? Go for it. We have all the time. <laughs> <laughs> In the next 30 minutes, I will talk about attenuation of seismic waves, especially um, in, the, in that regime where rocks are saturated with fluids. And I will introduce you to a couple of uh, mechanisms generating attenuation when fluids are present inside the, the, the pores. Um, I guess you can see my, my screen, right? That is correct. Okay, perfect. Okay, before doing that, I would like to give you an insight of what is rock physics. And uh, I take this from uh, one of the most famous rock physicists, Professor Gary Mafko, who says that rock physicists are fundamentally material scientists with humor. Uh, and um, fundamentally rock physics is the, the science for studying uh, materials which are geomaterials. So the materials which are, they, they, are, you know, they are related to, to our planet, and also to other planets right now. So uh, many rock physicists now are also working on studying materials which are on other planets or natural satellites of planets in our solar system. And fundamentally, it allows us to understand what is uh, standing below our feet, okay? So uh, thanks to uh, rock physics also, not only, uh, we have been able to go from a model of the interior of, the, of our planet that was depicted by Jules Verne in the in the 19th century with dinosaurs and mushrooms and uh, so on and so forth to a much more boring, if you want, model where we have layers, right? We have layers where we have a crust, we have a mantle, we have a, a, a core, an inner core, an outer core. And this is thanks to a methodology which is called seismic tomography, right? Or seismic methods in general. Seismic tomography is quite recent. And uh, the idea is to study the propagation of waves in the subsurface in our uh, planet. And uh, by studying these uh, seismograms, right, we can uh, infer about the properties of the materials in the subsurface. And we arrive to create models of the subsurface like the one that you have seen before, made of layers. Now, the problem of uh, seismic methods, although seismologists and all the geophysicists are aware, about what I'm going to, to, to introduce now. The problem I was saying is that many of the geophysicists, they use steel, elastic, and even sometimes only acoustic models to describe the propagation of these waves. And in reality, there is no perfect elastic material um, in this universe. Uh, uh, all materials, they tend to absorb the elastic energy that propagates inside them. And, um, the attenuation of these uh, waves, okay, is one of my topic, I would say is my bread and butter uh, topic, uh, is what I have been studying since long time. So the main idea of uh, attenuation is that in an infinite uh, quality factor, which is the inverse of attenuation, so very high quality factor means a very low attenuation, a wave will travel forever, and the unique reason why its amplitude will change is due to the fact that you're spreading that energy in bigger and bigger volumes, right? So this 
this uh, amplitude here is changing for that reason. I'll show you again the, <clears throat> the, the animation. In a, instead, in a, in a media where attenuation is finite, it's not infinite, it's not zero, sorry, uh, the quality factor is finite, it's not uh, infinite, uh, that uh, uh, amplitude of the wave will fade away pretty soon after the uh, beginning of the propagation. And uh, attenuation, right, is in fact defined as the ratio between the energies lost in a sinusoidal cycle divided the mean energy spent to propagate that wave, okay? So it's really a ratio between two energies, okay? So it's unitless. Now, to give you some numbers, right? Uh, the attenuation in rocks typically stands between 10 and 300. So a very uh, almost elastic rock, right? will have a, a quality factor around 300, talking about crustal rocks here, um, and uh, a very um, non-elastic rock will have a quality factor around 10. In metals, uh, you typically have attenuation, which is much lower, meaning quality factors which are much higher. And uh, just to give you a comparison, the attenuation of uh, rocks, so the quality factor of rocks is very similar to the quality factor of plastics, okay? Although the mechanism of attenuation are different. So why do we want to study attenuation? For the same reason that we study, we use geophysics to understand what is below our feet. We want to improve those models. We want to understand better what is below our feet. We want to, for example, uh, locate fluids in the subsurface and so on and so forth. So how do we measure attenuation of seismic waves in the laboratory at frequencies which are in the seismic range? And the seismic range uh, spans between roughly 0.1 Hertz up to 100 Hertz. Now, if you think about uh, a wavelength, right, of uh, uh, a wavelength, a seismic wave propagating with those frequencies, the wavelength of those waves would be kilometric from, from 30 meters roughly, right, to several kilometers. Therefore, we can't really study the propagation of the wave in the laboratory. We can't really take a sample, you know, one kilometer long, propagate a 100 hertz wave, even a 10 hertz wave in that case, and then study how the wave propagates. We need to find another way. And this came from engineering, uh, who start using this methodology in the beginning of the 20th century to study the null elasticity of metals. And the methodology is, is called the, the quasi-static method uh, in which you study the stress-strain relation rather than the wave propagation. And what you typically do, you deform your material, which is here in yellow, okay, like a sandstone, right? And uh, you can see here the, the material is described by a viscoelastic model, right? And uh, you deform such a material using typically an actuator. Let me show you again the, the, the simulation here. Uh, the animation, I would say. And uh, you measure the stress applied on the sample by using a, a load cell that measures the, the force and that can be, of course, uh, converting stress. And then you measure the shortening of this sample, which is the strain. Now, if the material is not perfectly elastic, then you will get a phase shift between the stress, which is the red, and the strain, which is the yellow. Also, these measurements allow you to measure a... Uh, modulus, in this case, the Young's modulus, because you are deforming the rock in, a, in an extension way, right? So you are deforming it along its axis, okay? So this kind of measurements, you typically uh, deform the sample of a strain, which is in the order of 10 to the minus six. So they are typically very tiny displacement uh, involved in this kind of measure. So where is important uh, attenuation? Where does really attenuation sticks out and, and becomes really a parameter that we should uh, consider. Um, before I told you that geophysicists, they use uh, elastic uh, um, models. They use also acoustic models sometimes. And many times those models, they work. They approximate the propagation of the waves uh, good, uh, good enough that, that uh, you can have a model of the subsurface which represents fairly well reality. However, there are many cases where those models become inappropriate and you need to introduce attenuation. 
And uh, some of these cases is uh, where you do have a transitory regimes. For example, you inject fluids in the subsurface and you are changing the, the saturating fluids in a reservoir, for example. Uh, especially when you have a partially saturated uh, case domain, when you have gas and liquids together. And um, the most exciting uh, in the most exciting part of attenuation is that attenuation can allow you to understand more about the subsurface and give a face to the processes that are creating attenuation. For example, the migration of a, pl of a, of a, of a gas plume, right, in the subsurface, um, and, um, uh, and so on. Uh, one of my uh, big uh, life motive, right, has been always to try to pair uh, uh, experiments in the laboratory with visualization me methods in, in order to understand, for example, this uh, patch saturation or, or partial saturation, where you have, uh, for example, gases and liquids together to see how the liquids are distributed inside uh, your rock and try to apply uh, theories and modeling in order to describe the observation in the laboratory. So uh, here is, is an example, right? Um, in 2018, Zoo and collaborators, they wrote this very famous paper now in JGR, where they show that in Frio pile site here in Texas, where we, they inject CO2 to try to understand CCS, and they monitor uh, the injection of CO2 uh, from a well into an observation well, right? So they had uh, geophones down this observation well and they were injecting the CO2 in this uh, uh, sand layer, uh, which is confined by shales above and below. And they were interested in understanding how the plume was moving inside this aquifer, okay? And um, uh, ZOO uh, shows very clearly that if you use attenuation to, uh, to uh, rather than simply VP uh, or VS or the ratio between VP and VS, you can get a batch better insight of where the plume is. So how does that plume create attenuation? Well, there are several reasons why a plume of gas inside a, a liquid saturated rock might create uh, attenuation. Um, and uh, fundamentally, in the uh, range of frequencies of interest, which is again the seismic uh, uh, range, right, between 0.1 and 100 hertz in this area here, there are fundamentally two or three big mechanism that create uh, uh, attenuation. And the squid flow here and the patch saturation can also be called wave-induced fluid flow. Because uh, thanks to the wave, which uh, changes uh, the, the volume of the pores, uh, there is uh, fundamentally a movement of the fluid induced by the, by the stress uh, applied by the wave. And because such a movement is, uh, uh, is controlled by the viscosity and the permeability of the rock, uh, such a movement is a viscous movement and it, it will eventually steal energy from uh, the wave. So that's why you create attenuation due to this wave-induced fluid flow mechanisms. Another uh, mechanism uh, might be scattering really at the limit, I would say, of the, of the higher frequencies. I would say scattering doesn't rock really happen, but it's also a possibility. Okay, so viscous flow, um, you can find uh, much of the data here, except the CT scan data in a paper that came out this year. Uh, this paper kind of uh, uh, collects a lot of data that I collected during my PhD and my first postdoc uh, at ETH. Uh, so these are uh, data that I'm, then I have, uh, uh, you know, work on it for several years after that. And uh, here we, we, we show uh, hundreds of, of, uh, of measurements done on Brea sandstone at different uh, uh, saturations and, and, and pressures. So um, the viscous flow, right, uh, is fundamentally controlled by the, by the bio um, uh, theory uh, because we are in quasi-static uh, stress conditions. We don't really need to use the full bio uh, theory, which also includes inertia, but we can uh, describe such um, a viscous flow inside the pores media uh, using the 1941 BO paper, which, which is a, a, a less general case. And fundamentally, you need to 
to do the stress balance, um, including the stress generated by the pore pressure, which is this term here, P. And this is a very famous BO coefficient that many, many geoscientists and engineers many times forget. We rather tend to apply Terzaghi right, than to apply BO. And then the second equation is nothing more than Darcy in the pores media, okay? So you couple these two equations and you try to, um, to study uh, the wave-induced fluid flow using such equation. So um, the pass saturation, there is a very nice paper from 2010 that describes a bit these uh, um, mechanisms uh, of attenuation. Uh, first author is Mueller, is a paper in geophysics. And it shows very nice figures and uh, it goes through all these wave induced fluid flow mechanisms. And the idea is that as the wave propagates through a system, imagine this is a rock and you have a pass saturation, maybe this is gas, or maybe this is liquids surrounded by gas, doesn't really change. Um, and as you create compression, then the liquid will tend to squeeze out from this area. So this is liquid in this case, and will tend to invade the part which is saturated in, in gas, okay? And uh, as you get in dilation instead, so your wave now is dilating your rock, uh, then the liquid will tend to be sucked back inside the area where it was initially, okay? And uh, fundamentally, uh, this is going to steal energy from the wave. It's going to create two effects. It's going to create uh, a decrease in the amplitude of the wave, and it's also going to create a phase in the wave itself, okay, a delay. In general, all attenuation mechanisms do that. They create uh, a, they decrease the, uh, the amplitude of the wave and they also create a phase, okay? Now, the interesting thing here is that the frequency of the patch saturation is a function of the permeability, the solid bulk modulus, the patch size, how big are these patches and the viscosity of the fluid. And you can see the permeability by the viscosity is nothing more than the mobility of the fluid inside our, our system. The other uh, attenuation mechanism, which is square flow, uh, instead uh, uh, it talks about the presence of a compliant pore and a stiff pore. And you can imagine that as the wave travels through the system, it will squeeze fluid out of, the, of this compliant pore into the stiff pore. And here, the frequency of the square is a function of the ratio between uh, the length and the height of this compliant pore, the solid bulk modulus and the viscosity. There are many other uh, mechanisms, but they all uh, rotate around this idea of the wave induced fluid flow, okay? So there are different flavors, right? I'm going to show you some results here from the laboratory and then very quickly uh, some modeling because I want to go to another mechanism, which is uh, the wave induced gas exolution dissolution, which is the second part of this talk. So we are going to use a breast sandstone, uh, different saturations. The sample was saturated from the bottom with fluid, so the gas eventually will stay up, but still we generate a pass saturation. Um, we are showing, I'm showing you a result from zero to 40 megapascal confining pressure and room temperature. The pore pressure is fundamentally room, room pressure, okay? Okay, so the, the first thing we can, we can see is that when, when, when we test dry breast sandstone, the Young's modulus increases as we increase the, the, pore, the, the confining pressure. And that's very well known. The interesting thing is that uh, uh, we don't have a frequency dependent attenuation. The attenuation is flat across the frequencies. And I'm going to show you here now in reality Young's modulus because attenuation, right, which is this in case, uh, goes together with dispersion of the velocity or dispersion of the modulus. So a change in attenuation would also create a change in the Young's modulus in this case, okay? And, um, the interesting thing is that from this study, which never, uh, and here is still written in preparation, in reality is already published. <laughs> I forgot to update this uh, slide, I'm sorry. Uh, the interesting thing in any case is that uh, one thing that uh, nobody never really, um, really show is that the low frequency attenuation in, um, decreases as you increase the confining pressure, right? So the quality factor you see goes from 100 to 160 and we, we, we attribute this uh, uh, behavior to the fact that you are compacting the grains, so you are decreasing the attenuation generated by the friction between the grains, okay? This was a sandstone, I want to remind you. Now we want to saturate the sample, right? And um, uh, since, uh, you know, uh, till when I 
I started working in Toronto, I was always suspicious about the fact that you create a patch saturation inside your rock while you are saturated from the bottom. But uh, the, the big experience I had in, in Toronto in using this pressure vessel where we saturate the sample, and we can see where the fluids are, helped me to convince myself that you really create a patch saturation. And this is an example where we injected the water in a much smaller sample, in fact, than, than the one that I'm showing you the results. But you can clearly see that the water in, uh, enters the sample from the bottom. These are, you know, I'm showing you the difference between uh, the first frame and the consecutive frames. And we are injecting this fluid and you can clearly see that you create a front. And in reality, if you look now, I'm not sure you can see that, but you can see the, the fringes coming, going up uh, uh, from there. So you really create a pass ratio, especially in this area here where you do have uh, fingering of those, uh, uh, you know, fingering uh, um, uh, upwards. Okay, so when we saturate our breast sense to a 60%, then we found that the attenuation as, uh, is really strongly frequency dependent, right? It's really is, is strongly frequency dependent. Um, you go from 1 hertz to 100, and your attenuation goes from fundamentally 100, uh, sorry, your quality factor goes fundamentally from 100 to 10, which is extremely low. But the other interesting thing that we found is that as you increase uh, the confining pressure, you find a maximum of attenuation, which eventually will decrease, okay? So the quality factor re-increases again as you increase the confining pressure. And that's kind of explained by the theory, you will see this later, but it's not fully described by the theory, which is, which is interesting, it's something to work on, right? So the mechanism why this happens exactly is not yet fully clear. Um, this is an example for, uh, again, roughly 60% uh, water and glycerin saturated this time. <clears throat> Sorry. Again, you see there is a, uh, an increase of attenuation and then eventually a decrease of attenuation as we increase the confining pressure. Uh, this is an example for 80% water saturated plus glycerin. And finally, 86% water plus glycerin saturated. Okay? They pretty much show all the same trend. Um, now, we also measure ultrasonic uh, elastic properties for these rocks. So before I've shown you result between one and a hundred hertz, right? Now I show you result around one megahertz, right? So here we say the rock is completely unrelaxed because you are, you are stressing it at a speed that which is too high to allow those mechanisms to, to occur, right? The movement of that, that, uh, that fluid in the pores is too slow uh, to be, um, uh, to happen in a, in, in a span of one cycle when the frequency is one megahertz, right? So we say that the rock is completely unrelaxed. So the fluid eventually will behave like a very stiff phase inside the pores, okay? So we measure the PVS for these rocks when saturated, and then we compile this very interesting figure where we put the low frequency result here, right? And the high frequency result, they, they line up here. And they line up fairly well with the theory, um, which is fundamentally the bio gasman hill limit, the upper line, and the Gassman fluid substitution for the bottom line. As, as we increase the confining pressure, we go from two to 14 megapascal, we see this uh, measurement getting closer and closer, meaning we have less dispersion, right? So we think about the, di the distance between uh, these dots are nothing more than the Young's modulus, uh, in this case, a very low frequency and a very high frequency. So that's dispersion, right? And uh, you can see that the theory follows fairly well the distribution of those dots. Okay, so this was kind of an interesting result. We went a bit further and we tried to model our results, right? So now these are three cases, 60% water saturated, 80% water plus glycerin, and 86% water plus glycerin, okay? And here you can see the, uh, for frequency between one and 100 hertz, the data, right, these dots, and in fact, between one and one kilohertz for the modeling. Okay, so here the shaded areas are the modeling, where so we are trying to model our result according to some theories. And in particular, the theories we are using is white 1975 plus uh, the correction introduced by Dutta and, Dutta and, and OD in 1979, four-part saturation. 
And we are using the model of Gurovich and the collaborators 2010 for squared flow. The squared flow is the red and the green is the patch saturation, okay? And what we uh, conclude here is that, eh, you know, uh, the models, they kind of describe the data, but they struggle many times, right? I mean, there are some very good uh, results here, but I, I might, they might simply be a coincidence, right? So the theory is not yet fully understood. And there might be additional mechanisms that they sum up to this uh, linear, right, um, uh, viscous flow in, in the portion. The other uh, mechanism that I want to talk about, and I think I still have maybe 10 minutes, I hope, Ali, uh, please tell me if I'm going too long. Um, I don't mind, you can continue. It's a very interesting topic, so please go ahead. The other mechanism I would like to talk about, uh, it's uh, mainly discussed in this paper for 20, 2015. So I was still a postdoc in Toronto, in fact, uh, when this paper came out. But uh, since I came here to uh, Austin, I've been trying to further a bit the research on this. And it's a, it's a work in progress, right? And the idea is that uh, you can have bubbles in the subsurface and you can have uh, very tiny bubbles that, for example, saturate uh, a, a domain above, for example, a CO2 sequestration site. Imagine you are sequestering uh, CO2 under this uh, shale layer, right? And then some part of the CO2 start escaping, okay? And then you create uh, a bubble rich area here uh, just above uh, the, the reservoir. And you want to monitor that with seismic methodologies. So for example, you have a source here, you have a couple of wells where you have uh, geophones, right? And you want to monitor what is going on in the, uh, under, under the shales inside the reservoir. And the, the question is, do attenuation will eventually tell us that something is going on and we are losing CO2 from the, from the subsurface? Well, imagine you do have these bubbles and they are, they are distributed in a homogeneous way throughout your domain. Yeah, you have a 10 hertz P wave in water, you have to think about that you will have a wavelength of 150 meters, right? In water, in rocks will be 300 meters, right? So imagine bubbles, which are microscopic in the, in the order of few microns, right? Inside the pores. So you can take one of those ones and treat one bubble with the water around as a representative elementary volume, right? And um, you try to understand what is the, uh, the response to an oscillating force of this system, right? So you try to force the system, <clears throat> try to understand how does the system deforms according to the elasticity of the water, the elasticity of the gas. And the third thing that you want to study is the fact that as you change the pressure in the water, you will force part of the gas to either exalt or dissolve the water. So if you're increasing the pressure, you will dissolve part of the gas in the water. If you are decreasing the pressure, you are exalting the gas back into the, into the bubble. You know, this uh, an assumption. We are assuming that the gas always uh, crosses this interface, right, between the gas and the liquid. Okay, so you put together the equations, which I, I, we don't need to discuss, but fundamentally you calculate first how many moles of gas you uh, di dissolve uh, uh, or exolve from the bubble as a function of the pressure, the, the far field pressure, if you want. And then you plug the number inside this other <clears throat> uh, order differential equation, which uh, uh, tells you how, what is the deformation rate of your bubble. And this includes also the elasticity of the gas, right? The second thing that we look at before. And then you need to plug this, this result together with the, 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 the book model deformation for water, how much the water is deforming elastically. And therefore you can calculate the volume of your bubble as a function of time, right? Sorry, the volume of your domain, right? As a function of time. The volume of the bubble comes from this equation and the volume of the water comes from this equation, okay? You can now uh, do another thing because now as you exolve and dissolve gas uh, through this, uh, uh, through this boundary, which is the bubble itself, right? You're going to create uh, a layer of water which is oversaturated in gas, and that will try to diffuse into the water which is instead not oversaturated, right? So you need to, to solve the, uh, a fourth equation, right? Which is the diffusion of the gas into the, into the water, okay? 
So we did that. And uh, we try to model these results. And you can see when you stress your domain, so you're looking here, let me pause a second. You're looking now in this uh, uh, animation here, you're looking at the concentration of gas in a very specific part of the, of the bubble in this area here, okay? This is a zoom area, okay? So you're looking at the, at the limit between the gas and the liquid, and you're looking at the concentration of the gas in the liquid, okay? Now we are stressing our domain with certain frequencies, and at the same time, we are calculating the bulk modulus of that domain. I mean, the bulk modulus tells you how much that domain is deforming under a certain pressure, right? And you can see as the, as the frequency increases, the bubble deforms less and less. At 0 0.1, it was deforming a lot. At 2.5 Hertz, it deformed barely. You can see the forms a bit, but not much. At 38 Hertz, it doesn't deform at all, right? It deforms very, very little, right? Now, this, uh, if, you, if you look at these results, what happens is that uh, if you look at the bulk modulus of your, of your, of your liquid, uh, liquid plus gas, it has an increase around a certain uh, corner frequency, right? And um, fundamentally, your, your fluid is becoming stiffer and stiffer as you increase the, uh, uh, the, the frequency. Now, if you do some calculation, you will immediately discover that uh, the, the variation of volume of the water and the variation of volume of the bubble, they are in the same uh, order of magnitude. However, the variation due to the dissolution dissolution of the gas in water is much, much bigger when the frequency is low and is fundamentally zero when the frequency is very high, okay? So you see 3.6 versus 0.14, right? Is one order plus, uh, order magnitude plus uh, uh, more than, uh, than the volume of bubble for the elasticity. Now you can take these results, you can plug it in inside uh, the Gassman fluid substitution and you, you will obtain a attenuation for your, your rock saturated with the liquid, okay? And what you will discover is that as you move from 0 0.1 Hertz to, for example, 30 Hertz, right? Your rock will attenuate seismic waves, um, in this case, around five Hertz, okay? And also the velocity of the seismic waves, here you are showing the book, the Young's modulus, you know, that's in any case related to a velocity. Uh, the velocity will also increase as you move from low frequency to high frequencies. Now, the widget, right, the wave-induced gas resolution dissolution, um, what is a, a, a attenuation mechanism that uh, many people like, but many people do not like because they don't believe it exists. So since I'm here in, uh, since I'm here at UT Austin, I've been trying to uh, show the wave-induced uh, gas resolution dissolution uh, mechanism, taking away fundamentally the rock. I want to show this simply in a system which is extremely simple, where you have a liquid and a bubble. And the idea is to take a syringe uh, controlled by a stepper motor. And uh, in, in here, you have a liquid with a small bubble that you can see in this figure here in the computer. So the microscope has a camera and we can look at the bubble itself, which is a few millimeters in diameter, probably one millimeter in diameter. And what we can do here, we can uh, <clears throat> change the pressure using the stepper motor. Um, in this case, we change the pressure very rapidly and look at how the bubble deforms uh, in time. And we are doing, so are fundamentally look at the creep of the, of the bubble. And I have to thank, uh, uh, Zi Chi Jin, Dr. Zi Chi Jin now, uh, who was a visiting student in my lab who put up together this equipment and he, he did the first experiment. And I keep doing those experiments and uh, hopefully soon there will be a publication out. So the, I'm going to show you very quickly the results. Here's the bubble uh, taken by the, uh, by the computer, right, in the computer. And then here we suddenly increase the pore pressure, the, the, the pressure, right, in the liquid, which stays stable for roughly 70 seconds, and then we decrease it again. And then you can see here the, the size of the bubble, right? Which is uh, measured using a software, right? In the, uh, from, from the images. But you can see very clearly that the bubble does not keep the size. The bubble, after an initial deformation, which is mainly elastic, it creeps, right? It changed the, 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 the size of roughly an additional 1%, right? 
And if we try to take our wave-induced gas exclusion dissolution model and we try to fit these results, surprise, surprise, I was really surprised when I did this because I thought I would have encountered more problems in fitting the data. The, the, the data are fitted perfectly by the model. It's kind of interesting, okay? So fundamentally, now, if we plug in, so I kind of prove that uh, you know, the wave-induced gas exclusion dissolution exists and it works. Now we can try to plug in those attenuation for the rock saturated with bubble that we, we calculated before, and I can try to propagate waves and, uh, and show you what will be the wave, uh, which is felt by some sensors in this, uh, um, in this uh, well here, in this borehole. Imagine you have uh, seismometers down here and you create uh, an explosion in this side and you want to see if there is bubble here. So in this case, right, you are propagating the wave. There is no bubble on the top of the shales of the reservoir. In this case, instead, you have bubbles inside the, the pore space, right? And now you look at the, at the amplitudes here in this area, and then you will immediately discover that the P wave, right, will decrease up to 38% in case you have that kind of attenuation in this area here, okay? So potentially, uh, this mechanism could explain attenuation in bubbly bearing rocks, right? And uh, of course, this can be applied only to, can be applied to many other uh, cases in nature. Uh, for example, in hydrothermal and volcanic system, uh, paper uh, that res recently came out, Piston and collaborators, uh, we studied the attenuation in magmas, right? And using exactly the same, uh, well, not exactly the same uh, wave-induced gas exclusion distribution that you've just seen. There is an additional term there, which is uh, um, uh, which uh, is referred to the viscosity, because in magma, one of the big uh, uh, controllers, right, is uh, uh, is the viscosity of the fluid. Anyway, I'm going towards the the conclusion. Okay, so uh, rock physics is really necessary uh, if you want to improve geophysics, which is the way we have to explore the subsurface for many reasons, right? Um, I don't even want to talk about hydrocarbons. Let's talk about uh, injection of hydrogen in subsurface. Let's talk about the geothermal. We still need geophysics because we need to understand what is going on while we do something in the subsurface. And rock physics, uh, it uh, goes together with geophysics because it allows geophysics to understand uh, um, the signals, right, that geophysics uh, eventually acquired. And I sh I've shown you here a couple of examples, a couple of mechanisms, the wave-induced fluid flow and the wave-induced gas exclusion dissolution, which are attenuation mechanisms that can explain why there is attenuation in saturated media. Thank you very much. I would like to thank, of course, my group, which shrink a bit lately because a couple of students, Eric, from Toronto, by the way, and uh, and and uh, and Ken, where is Ken here? Uh, graduated, and Zichi came back to China after visiting. Uh, so um, I want to thank all my students and my sponsors. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sato. Very interesting presentation. I specifically like in your uh, in your conclusion where you said lab and numerical both have to go together. You can't do one and just leave the other or the other way around. I agree. Yeah. yeah. You know, problems are very complicated nowadays. And uh, yeah, let's say numerical or modeling, modeling in general. Yeah, modeling yeah. Can, be, can be theoretical. Um, when I, I try always to use analytical solutions, but uh, nowadays it's difficult. <laughs> uh, many problems are very overcomplicated by geometries. And uh, okay. so, yeah. We don't really have yet a solution for Navier-Stokes equations, for example. Right? So that's, yeah. Anyway. So, um, so we have some fellow colleagues. So we have Anton here. Um, I actually got 